I mean, hip bones, collarbones, like you really get railed. <laughs> railed on that thing. You do. I mean, it's such a violent car. And um, the other thing talking about just the violence of it and, and the physical nature, you know, they run them on the deck and dragging the bottom of a cup car is nothing like dragging the bottom of an indie car. I mean, it literally at times can knock the wind out of you. It's so violent. And they're like, oh no, that's that's fine. That's normal. I'm like, what? <laughs> Things dragging the ground, pounding the ground, uh, breaking zones, you know, all that stuff. It's it's a very it's a beast of a car. Like I am so impressed and so thankful I've been able to create this opportunity because I don't I don't know if I'll ever have a chance to drive such a high performance car ever again. I mean, these things are beasts. I believe that each and every one of us has the power within ourselves to create the life that we really want. And I want to help give you the tools to make that happen. I'm Danica Patrick, and I'm pretty intense. Today on the show is an old friend of mine. His name is Jimmy Johnson. We used to get raced against each other in NASCAR. Um, and funny enough, now he's racing IndyCar. <laughs> he retired from NASCAR this last year, and now he's venturing out into the IndyCar world and doing road courses, which is such a valiant thing um, to go from a seven-time cup champion to being humbled to an indie car and kind of starting over is just really admirable. And, you know, Jimmy is, uh, Jimmy's a really smart guy. He's a really, he's a really hard worker. And, you know, that's why I feel like he is going to be successful in no matter what he does. And we also talked about how, <laughs> how much, how physically demanding an indie car is to a stock car, which is something I used to kind of lie to everyone a little bit about. Not lie, I just omitted how hard indie car was compared to NASCAR. Um, his physical physical fitness, which is something that he's super passionate about, uh, is something that's being he needed. I mean, like I, I think that if you're not somebody who has a lot of physical fitness, indie car is a very tough thing. Um, so he's fitting right in and enjoying it. Um, but also, you know, we talked about life. We talked about you know perspectives on things and kids and family and the world today and what's going on. And um, then we wrapped up with a nice, fun conversation about Burning Man. So I ended up finding out that Jimmy and I and his wife, Shani, um, uh, we could probably cohabitate. Uh, so I'll let you listen to the episode to figure out how. Enjoy. What do you think of all the stuff going on? Did you get that's, into it? That's yeah. I mean, it's hard not to. I mean, with uh, our oldest at 10, she's very aware of current events, you know, it doesn't matter what really? it is. Oh, very much so. Um, and it's weird how much conversation really happens in school and amongst friends. You know, the kids are listening to their parents all the time. And it's really amazing wow. to hear the different points of views and, and very broken information because they're overhearing conversations. But it's led to um, Evie picking up the newspaper. We get the newspaper every day. And I literally have to uh, make sure that she doesn't dig in because her curiosity will take her and she'll ask very intelligent questions, but it just seems to be, there's just too much right now. You know, the news is just not a place for 10 year olds. What do you feel like she, what does she ask you about the most? Or what does she say that you're like, whoa. Her compass is really in the what's fair category. So racial or social injustice, uh, current events, um, the White House, you know, her, she's very curious of where right and fair is. And I'm very proud of her for that perspective yeah. and, and really big of her, you know, obviously at her age at 10. Yeah. Does she have an opinion? I'm curious what a 10 year old's opinion is on like, dad, this shouldn't be happening or they should do this. Opinions. There seem to be less opinions and more questions. And Shani and I are quickly diverting the conversation into a, a different direction. And maybe we should spend a bit more time talking about things, but it, it really, you know, her, her curiosity is on the forefront and, and her opinions really aren't there yet. She, now my, my younger one's probably different. And if she was engaged on this matter, she definitely would have an opinion, but just Evie's mind and the way she works uh, she's just very slow to have an opinion in general because she wants to collect all the information first. Mm. Mm. So interesting because I, I mean, you, like you said, maybe Shani and I should participate in the conversation, but then it makes me think of how in our world of racing, like there were two things that you just kind of didn't really deal with. And that one of them was religion and the other one is politics. Like you just, 
stay away. Yeah. And so do you feel like it's something that you've always just stayed away from or just because of maybe our sort of um, environment or is that something you're actually into? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've stayed away and I, for professional reasons and also personal reasons, you know, as time goes on, the political conversation is, is harder and harder to have. And I don't mind engaging. Um, I want to make sure that the friends that I'm speaking to on the topic, you know, are willing to hear both sides potentially um, and, and have an open conversation. I mean, it's so hard to know where right or wrong is uh, for, for many reasons, but I, I proceed with caution. I absolutely have my own opinions and, and my own thoughts that go into it all, but I don't know why I would assume because of the professional um, structure, as you mentioned, I've, I've always been more reserved in, in especially the, the uh, politic conversation. Why do you think that is? Like, why does racing stay so far away from politics? Because ultimately, in my opinion, we, um, you know, we are an extension of the marketing for these given brands. And most brands, if not all, sell to both parties or all parties or all people. Mm -hmm. So taking a hard stance, I think, can put you into um, a situation sometimes. But, you know, morally, at the end of the day, we all have to make that decision if it's something we feel strong about and want to stand up for yeah. or have an opinion on and weigh in and, and deal with the ramifications. But like, has anyone ever really done that even? I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think if anyone's really like been super political I, I don't think so. I feel like in other sports, especially with the invite surrounding um, a championship and going to the White House, you know, there's been some banter with other sports. You know, I feel like last summer with the social injustice issues that we had in the country and NASCAR taking a stand and drivers taking a stand, yeah. it's probably the, the most I've been in and around or exposed to anything like that. Yeah. What was that like when that was going on? Because that was a big deal. I mean, the the whole Bubba situation. And I mean, yeah. I mean, I saw, obviously I'm watching from a distance now, but what was it like? What was it like? You know, pulling into Talladega and, you know, the front road, uh, it turns into the main tunnel entrance yeah. to see, you know, at least 50 mm -hmm. cars um, flying rebel flags and Trump flags and, you know, just, just the gathering that was there, a uh, airplane flying low above hand. Um, I can't recall exactly what the the banner behind the aircraft was. It was towing by, you know, that, that was, that was pretty crazy. And, and that was a moment in time where I was thankful we didn't have fans at the track. Mm. You know, there was just so much going on and to have that kind of gathering um, there then um, was, was one piece of it. But when you, work through the next couple of days and, you know, the pull rope in the garage and thinking it was a news, worrying about my friend's safety and health. And, you know, all that just rolled up into something that on the inside was, was probably far different than what it looked like on the outside. And I know some on the outside wanted to poke fun at, at what took place and, and not truly understand what that environment was inside, but inside it was, it was not unlike anything I've ever experienced in sports. Do you feel like as the, you know, most accomplished veteran in the series, like you have to do something? Like, was there a moment where you felt like maybe I should, I don't know. You know, I, I would say maybe a week or two beforehand, we came out with a video um, that was a driver initiative that really spoke to the, the social and racial injustice that was going on. And, and I certainly felt like I needed to be involved there and, and had more of a leadership role in all of that. Um, then once we, we ended up in, I think it was the Atlanta race weekend is, is the time frame of it. And then a few weeks later in Talladega, um, I, I went to Bubba as a friend and just texted him and said, Hey man, I'm going to, I'm going to stand with you during the national anthem. Mm -hmm. uh, that was race day morning when I found out about the news and that gesture, you know, others heard about it. Others wanted to join and before he knew it. Um, other drivers had opinions on how to, how to help make that moment more than team managers were calling and texting me to figure out how they could be involved. And then we had that beautiful uh, moment where the drivers all pushed Bubba's car down pit lane and the crew members were hopping off the wall, standing and falling in behind and, and off the front of the field we went. So 
Uh, the first one, more of a leadership role. The second part at Talladega, I was just, just being a friend. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. Um, I always think, I think a lot about, you know, I even posted a video the other day on social media, just talking about like the great divide kind of thing where, you know, there's so much stuff in the world that creates division and it's, you know, what do you, whether it's shoot, whether it's a race team, a sporting team, a color in which you believe in for politics, whatever, like there's so many things that divide us and there you are being a leader to unite and like not have a dividing moment and um, put everything on the same playing field level, visually, emotionally. And I mean, what do you, I mean, do you think about that much? Do you, do you feel like you want to do something in that area? Do you have an opinion? Do you, do you, have you ever felt that? Like, I don't know. I feel like there's so much stuff to divide us. There, there really is. And there's very little bringing us together. And I think our, um, oh, what's the right word? Our stamina um, or maybe tolerance that we have left um, with all that we've faced as a, a country, as a world with a pandemic, um, you know, adding to the, you know, the conversation about the, the social and, and racial injustice and having a voice and all that. I mean, it's, we're all pretty fatigued, long story short. And I, I get it and I understand it. And I know that I don't want to be preached to, but I certainly respect and admire those that, that live their life a certain way. And, and it's easy to notice that, Hey, they're, they're heading down this road. And I, I support that. And as a father, I've also learned that my words, to my kids mean one thing, but my actions mean something far greater. So when I roll that all up, I, I kind of feel like that it, it, some can make me say it's the easy way out, but I think that the way that I live my life, the way that I interact with people, the work that my foundation does, when I am comfortable to stand up and talk or stand up and lead, you know, handling those moments through, through real actions and, and uh, showing really who I am, I think is good way to help use my power, my tools to lead others that are Jimmy Johnson fans, that are fans of the sport in, in a way that you're not lecturing and beating people over the top of the head with. Uh, I mean, I, I think we're just all way too fatigued to deal with that. Yeah. So it's kind of about really like just doing instead of saying there's so many people that are out there complaining or screaming from the mountaintops things, but it's really about like, how do you live your life? Is that totally. what you're trying to say? Totally. Exactly right. And I would only add that Maybe not from the mountaintops, but from the basement of their mom's house in their underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Social like, media changes the game. It is. It can be awful. It's very useful and helpful, but it can be awful. You'd probably rather be on the mountaintop skiing <clears throat> is the only mountaintop that you're kind of interested in, right? That is so true. Need eat powder on the mountaintop. Mm, I've snowboarded a couple of times. Um, I've never skied. Uh, and... Um, Powder is definitely better for snowboarding. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, I no, fell on my ass a couple of times so <laughs> hard on um, a snowboard. It was like morning time and the slopes were groomed. So like traversing to a lift to get to another area. And it was like with a snowboard man. Have you snowboarded? Yeah. 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 You can probably do a lot better job describing this, but I'm like trying to keep my momentum up. And when it gets to the low and slight, the flatter, wider groomed area, it's just, it's like rock hard too. Cause it's the morning and I'm like, you can't go dead straight. Cause you'll definitely catch an edge. Definitely. And then, so I'm like, just trying to turn just enough, but it didn't matter. I caught an edge and I <laughs> fell on my ass so hard, like two times in a row. And I just started bawling and I'm in my goggles and I'm just bawling and bawling and bawling and I can't even sit down. And uh, that's my experience. But I feel like I want to ski. You know, both have their pros and cons and both are, are uh, you know, there's a learning phase there where you, know, you hit the ground often and it hurts. But I think skis, especially ski technology today has really opened up and it's easier to load the ski, get it to bend, get it to turn. Um, at the same time, board technology has come a long way. And I started off as a skier. Shandy turned me into a boarder. And then once kids came along, we've been back on skis uh, to help teach them and be with them. But uh, we, have, we had a rule that if you're 10, you can, you can choose to snowboard. And Evie has exercised that option this winter. Um, so now, now she needs a boarding partner. So I feel like I will end up back on a board some. 
But to your point, I'm going to make sure there's fresh powder down because a snowboard in the ice or in the bumps, you know, it's really not, not, not a lot of fun. I felt like, I don't know. I felt like a snowboarder wants like the opposite of what a, um, the opposite of a, uh, of a skier. I mean, from a technique standpoint is like a skier wants like a groomed, like not super steep is nice, but a snowboarder would want like steep and, and powder. Is that like, would that be right? Yeah. Or I mean, am I just so bad at snowboarding? I have no idea what I need. <laughs> no, I, I, I think steep and deep in both environments is the way to do it. Um, but the right skis are required. You know, you need wider skis for the flotation and it's certainly a lot more work. Um, but from a, you know, on mountain or in bounds perspective, you know, most groomers are, are more fun on a set of skis than, than a snowboard. A lot just has to do with how important it is to be on an edge. And on a snowboard, you have one edge and skis, you have two. And you're kind of faced the right way to recover and save yourself. But um, we spent a winter out in Colorado, maybe three or four years ago. And we were just typical kind of skiers up until then. But to get a full winter in, I think I had like 85 days of skiing. Um, It really elevated my game. And now I can get around pretty good in anything. What'd you notice from a fitness standpoint? I'm curious. Cause you're obviously into fitness, you're into training, you know, especially like endurance. And, um, but did you notice a difference in your body with a lot more skiing? I'm just curious. You know, I'd say a couple pieces to it. One being at altitude. Um, I felt like my, my aerobic cardio output was better when I'd come back from being at, uh, at altitude. I didn't feel like the strength was any better, but like the longer the duration or just mm. cardio, lower heart rate cardio events were a lot easier, but it was so easy to put on bad weight at skiing through the winter. You know, just the, the environment of, of yeah. powder pancakes on a powder day to, you know, an, an evening meal Wine. or whatever it was, just that, that cadence of eating. I ate way more than calories burned. So, yeah. Wow. I think of like skiing and I'm like drinking a bunch of red wine, like steak and red wine every night, you know? (laughs) That's so, so one point right there. So what's your training like now? Okay. Obviously I'm going to have to ask all about IndyCar. I'm so curious what your thoughts are. And I know you've been testing a lot. Um, uh, and I I thought it was a a funny also scenario that, you know, here you are like retired yet, (laughs) You're now learning a whole nother craft, which is kind of like another craft. Indie cars are so different as you're maybe realizing. Yes. And then, I mean, it's still racing, but everything's different within the actual action. And then on top of it, you're retired, but now you're actually a school teacher. Shani's coming and saying hi right now. She's checking Oh, out. tell her I said hi. And Danica, you want to say hi? <laughs> she can't see you. Oh, hey, Danica. Hi, beautiful. So good to see you. It's How are the girls? They're good. She's so wonderful. Um, but that's a thing, right? Keeping kids busy. It is. I mean, and then your patience to deal with them through school and to be a good parent and handle things, right? You just realize how uh, critical school is and how teachers are all saints and so helpful in the whole thing. What do you mean critical school is? The learning at home from your parents, like that whole notion of, we all know it so well, we may or may not, I know I didn't really want to uh, listen to my parents all that closely. Most kids are probably in that same thing. So to be, you know, for your education to depend on that relationship with your parents is tough. Um, So there's, there's plenty of challenges. (laughs) (laughs) They don't listen to you. No, and they know they can get away with stuff and they got to check out and you're worried about their education. So there's this interesting tension and concern where you're trying to keep them on task and you know you, you get through everything and you're not sure they really retained it and depending on how long homeschooling lasts you know you, you feel like you're kind of leaving and leaving a mark in their education yeah. as they become older you know I mean I know they're young and probably everything at this point is pretty important but do you think some of the stuff that they have to learn is kind of no, nah, first grade for the youngest one. Like last year was kindergarten when we did did a lot of homeschooling. It, it was really not a big concern. Um, but fourth grade for Evie, you know, we're, we're more concerned about that. Do you feel like it's all valuable information? Like, I'm just going to say that I am not one to advocate for school. I have a GED. I like was gone all the time. And 
I to feel like I'm going to use math, use um, reading and some critical thinking. Um, but I'm a little judgmental of school because, you know, I'm doing fine. And also I don't feel like I blew off my intelligence and just would throw it away and say like, Oh, I'm not smart just because I know I didn't finish school. So there's some basic like historical information and a few odds and ends that I just don't know that most people do. However, I've applied myself in so many other ways that I'm educated in other ones. So anyway, I just think schools, I don't know. I don't disagree. And I have a very similar path with, you know, my racing and, and made it through high school and that was it. It's wild though. When you, you know, when you're the little ones depend on you, you just want to load the gun for their life, the best that you can. So you, you end up with, this is one of many interesting pressures that kind of show up as a parent that, you know, I, I really never thought about before or, or thought that I would care about, but as time goes on and you watch them grow, you're like, man, I want to give them their best chance. So it's an interesting pressure that grows. Well, what's your perspective? You said you have a similar one. You didn't go to college. No, no, didn't go to college. I tried a couple semesters. Chevrolet was nice enough to um, in- encourage me to go to school and said they would pay for my tuition if I completed the course with uh, any class with a, you know, a B. Um, so I started two semesters and once travel kicked up, I was, I was out and didn't see it through. And then there certainly are gaps. Um, you know, it, it hasn't completely um, stopped me from progressing where I wanted to in my career. And, and certainly having a passion at a young age and pursuing something with all my heart was, was most important in, you know, the, the journey my life's taken. Yeah. So should they go to college? I'm going to encourage it, but at the I same time, if they're time, a doctor, obviously we want a doctor to go to college, right? Maybe a lawyer, but I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm more interested, I think with my 45 years of living life in having something I'm truly passionate about that I hope that they can find that at a young age. And then that passion will help kind of build the road for what they need to learn. Um, ultimately, I believe you just, you need to enjoy your life. You need to wake up every day inspired and peaceful and balanced. And certainly, you know, there are plenty of challenges thrown at all of us as life goes on. But it, for me, having that carrot out there in front of me, the thing I've been passionate about always kind of guiding my life has, has really served me well. And as a, mm. as a father, I hope to, I hope that my kids can find that as well. Mm. What are some of those other things you do? I mean, like you have the passion of racing, but you know, there's other things. There's other things we can do to be happy. There's other things we can do to stimulate us. Um, I'm sure you've got other hobbies. I mean, other interests and, but like, what are your kind of routine things that you do that you've found that really put you in the right frame of mind and make you happy? I would say that I'm, I need to be active and to physically do things and accomplish things. Um, just sit down and read a book or, you know, find a topic that I'm interested in and pursue it online and learn. That's, it's really not what I'm inspired to do, but if Shani gives me a honeydew list of things that we need done around the house, I'll jump on the list and I feel accomplished. I'm crossing things off the list if I'm physical and, and, and doing it. Um, so in, in general, that's kind of the way I'm wired and clearly racing all the things through my life that I have has fit into that box as well. Um, the importance of training has uh, has ramped up over the years, and certainly more now that I'm transitioning in Indy cars. As you so well know, well know the cars are way way more physical than a NASCAR vehicle. Mm-hmm. And in that whole journey, I've I've realized, you know, the importance of nutrition, hydration, physical activity, and the the benefits that I pick up from it physically and mentally. Um, I, I didn't think the mental piece would come along, but you know, the, the endorphin release of training and, and how that helps my temperament and mindset feeling accomplished. Um, for me, if I get in that training session, I make good decisions all day long, uh, mm. from a health and wellness standpoint. So, you know, I've, that's become a more critical part of my life as mm. I've grown older and Shani as well. And we're trying to figure out how to kind of create those meeting points where we can do that stuff together. If it's skiing or cycling, um, I'm trying yoga occasionally, which, I'll send you a photo. You'll die. It is not, uh, 
it's not my thing, but if we can do it together, and I know it's helping me, we'll, we'll try it. So, you know, I'm a doer at the end of the day. Yeah. Shani likes yoga. Yes. She yeah. is a natural. I mean, her flexibility, yeah. well, she actually gets in trouble with the yoga instructors that she's like gone past the point of the muscle hold. And she's like counting on a joint to hold her up. She's that flexible. I know those people and I want to flip them off when I'm in class. I'm like, <laughs> gosh, just because your shoulders and your hips have no joints whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I'm over here. Like, you know, feeling like, you know, cause I've sat like this my whole life. I'm like, can my shoulders just open up a little bit? Your shoulders tight. I bet your shoulders. Oh my gosh. So tight. Yeah. And then the new workout program is not helping that any either. Okay. So you said it. I mean, when I came to, in, when I went to NASCAR, people were like, how are you going to handle that big car physically? And I'm like, I actually kind of bit my tongue and didn't okay. say how much easier stock cars were to drive than NASCAR. Cause I thought if people want to give me credit for being off, able to handle these big cars and so hard, I'm just going to let them think that I got it. Um, I mean, I said it, but I didn't make a big deal about it, but it's true. Like what have you experienced? The, you know, there's many pieces to it, but depending on the track and the steering wheel load and, and clearly you know, you're hanging on to the steering wheel. So forearms, arms, and general shoulder, uh, that stuff seemed pretty logical to me and obviously the neck, but I didn't realize just the true importance of core strength, of back strength, lower back mm-hmm. strength. Um, that's been something I've been working really hard on. And after my f- two test sessions last year, um, I, I was pretty sore afterwards and I tested a car two days ago and I, f- I feel great and have been back in the gym working out. So I'm making the right gains there, but it was at Sebring two days ago. And the thing that was so impressive to me with these cars is the intensity. And a lot of my training has been shorter duration and a lot higher intensity compared to what I did for NASCAR. And I, I can see why, I mean, you, you know, Bristol and to me, I've been telling a couple of friends that have from the NASCAR side that have asked post test what, what I think and driving that Indy car is like qualifying at Bristol, but every lap and every corner, I mean, yeah. you are so committed it, you're 10 tenths the whole time and the car can take it, which is just wild. That was what I always said about an Indy car was that it's pure potential is so far beyond what you think it could do. That's the hardest thing is like getting all the way to that edge, believing that you're like, wait a minute, you mean I could possibly go flat around Richmond in an Indy car? <laughs> you know, you're like, and just when the wheel loads and gets heavy, like you think, I mean, there's so much feedback coming through the wheel. I mean, just yeah. about like the weight of it. And I don't know about you, but the weight of it always translated to um, it, like being loose, like oversteer as you're learning the terminology, no, oversteer, understeer. <laughs> <laughs> trying i'm failing miserably it's thankfully okay. the team's cool with it <laughs> it gets confusing right because that's the thing is like again you're driving a race car but there's so many things that are even opposite where like in a in, a, in an indie car you're talking about understeer oversteer you're talking about the front of the car and when you talk about it in nascar you're talking about loose and tight and a lot of times loose like you're talking about the back of the car and so i mean it's just there's a lot of differences but wow. um but yeah there's no power steering and for sure, how about the belts? Have you, cause I mean, that was one of the things when I got back in the car for the 500 to do that last race of my career, um, I was like, shit, I forgot how tight the belts have to be. <laughs> yeah. You can't get to them. I mean, they, they, uh, I wish the lap belt could be a little tighter. Um, oh, they can make them tighter. They can't, but the guy can't get them buckled. We were just dealing with that at the test session. You know, they have to put all that on for you. And yeah, you got to exhale. You got to sink your body. And I'm trying. Exhale. Yeah, yeah. My suits right now have pockets on them. And that extra material is the problem why they couldn't clip it. So, well, oh yeah. So I remember that too, when I would get in the car and then since also, cause it's hit so hard on your hip bones that you, um, like I would pull the pocket of my suit to the middle so that it was smooth over my hip bones. And then since the center is kind of a little bit more space in there than on the actual hip points where the act, where the belts hit, that's what I would do with the pockets. I I take that advice and put it into play. I appreciate it. <laughs> Have you, yeah. Cause I mean, that's the thing too, is like, I mean, hip bones, collarbones, like you really get railed. <laughs> rail on that thing you do i mean it's such a violent car and um the other thing talking about 
just the violence of it and, and the physical nature, you know, they run them on the deck and dragging the bottom of a cup car is nothing like dragging the bottom of an Indy car. I mean, it literally at times can knock the wind out of you. It's so violent. And they're like, Oh no, that's, that's fine. That's normal. I'm like what <laughs> thing is dragging the ground, pounding the ground, uh, breaking zones, you know, all that stuff. It's, it's a very, it's a beast of a car. Like I am so impressed and so thankful I've been able to create this opportunity because I don't, I don't know if I'll ever have a chance to drive such a high performance car ever again. I mean, these things are beasts. Why? Like, why did you decide to do it? Cause like, it's a big feat. I mean, you can see why maybe it's a little bit more normal to go from IndyCar to NASCAR than NASCAR to IndyCar. Yeah. Just I mean, because the intensity, like it's super hard to be good in a stock car. Don't get me wrong. If it was that easy, I'd have won everything. And I didn't. Um, but it's just like the, I don't know, it's just like something about it is so, like you said, it's so intense. The sweet spots in different places, you know, I mean, sure it's a car, but they're, they're really different. Um, and for me, I mean, I always wanted to be an Indy car driver as a kid growing up and oh, yeah. after driving Fernando's formula one car a few years ago, when we did the swap, I was like, I, I've always wanted to do this. This experience only made me want to experience more. Mm. And I, I started the process and I was surprised to see there was interest in uh, amongst the teams. And then from there, it was like, all right, well, if we can get some sponsorship put together, we can pull it off. And I was able to get Carvana in the mix and put them on the car. So, so here we are. And I, I am not expecting the type of success I had in cup, but I am um, really trying to tell myself. And of course the competitive side is going to kick in and I'm, I'll be sad plenty next year or this year, but the experience to do this is really where my heart is. Um, I've always wanted to, to race one of these cars and be in the paddock, new word that I learned, and be around this, this industry. And who really gets that opportunity? I mean, some of my heroes when I was a kid would, would move back and forth. You've been one of the few that moved back and forth. Dario, um, there's only a handful of people that have ever been able to experience both. And where I sit today, that's something that's really important to me. It's something that I'm, I'm very glad to be a part of. Mm. What do you, I mean, if you were to, I mean, like, of course, like you said, your goal is to win. You're not going to be doing it. You're not doing it because you're like, I don't actually want to win. I just love to be. A right. lover. But outside of that, do you feel like you can have, what are your realistic goals? I mean, winning is possible for sure. You're Jimmy Johnson, but it's going to be hard. No, there, I mean, anytime you, you line up, you've got to believe that you have a shot to win or else it's not worth going. Um, it's just not how many of us are wired. Right. You know, right now I'm trying to really remind myself of my early days in racing and, mm. and I, I've, I am starting over for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. And I found a lot of um, peace of mind when I tried to crawl before walk, walk before run, and, and just keep it that basic and simple. And right now, my goal is to get within a second of Scott Dixon when we're at a test session at a track. And I'm super close. Like I, if, if one of these typical things, if I would have completed the lap and didn't spin, I would have been a half second off of them. But uh, I didn't at Sebring when I was there a couple of days ago, and I'm right about a second off the pace. And when I look at November where I was, that was three seconds off the pace. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of DPI testing, um, a lot of Formula Three driving, trying to go to these tracks, trying to kind of forget the NASCAR piece and rewire myself to a Formula car. I'm, I'm making progress and I have a lot more driving set up between now and the start of the season. And, um, you know, hopefully I can get in that. That's, I feel like once I get in that second window, then the car set up my conversations with teammates, the engineering meetings, like I can be in the conversation then at three seconds off the pace where I was in November, uh, you know, they just need to keep putting tires on the car and let me go. Like I shouldn't be a part of the, of helping steer the team and, and providing data and input. So uh, that's really the first objective for me is to get to that point. Yeah. Well, I think this is kind of applicable across the board for people that, I mean, shoot right now of all times in the history, like people are making so many transitions and your perspective on like how to approach that being so successful in one area going to another is I think really valuable for people. Yeah, there, there is a, uh, a, a moment here and 
Um, you know, I've been working on a few projects to kind of document all of this that's going on just, just because it is an interesting perspective and many are kind of going through that stuff. Um, been recording and collecting um, content for probably 18 months now, knowing that my final year was coming and this hopeful transition and working on a docu-series. And then I, I have another picture book that we're putting together and working on now to kind of document that as well. I'm really not into books. So amongst all, you know, I've had a ton of pressure to write a book, yeah. autobiography or something. Um, I'm just not there yet. I'd rather do it through images or video at this point. But um, it, it is an interesting journey and there's going to be plenty of failures. You know, I think many people think, um, you know, my cup career and, and all the success that I had, that it's just been this, you know, easy come, you know, situation for me. And there certainly is a, a start to all of that, trying to make my way into the cup series, the success that I then had, and then this kind of rebuild of sorts, or, uh, I don't know what you quite call it, but it's kind of starting over, you know, I'm a 45 year old rookie, which is wild. In a few different ways. I mean, you'll eventually be fully retired, but for now you're doing something new. What, I mean, do you have something you're scared of? Like, is there something you feel like, man, if this happens, I'm, it's going to be a difficult one for me to deal with. Are there fears making this transition and being, I mean, essentially vulnerable? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think we're all fearful of not being successful or, or being uh, competitive. So I think it's, it's really in my head to, to, determine what that is and not care what others might think. You know, if I, if I choose to check in on social media on my phone, um, there's plenty of opinions there that, that could, could bother me. Um, so it's really about being in tune with myself and my team and my sponsor on, on this, this journey and what this is really about. And, you know, the experience that I'm, I'm hopeful to have, I think there's a, there's a great story in all that. And, and one that many can identify with that, that's, actually a bit more rich than just, you know, I'm here to win races and uh, we had a bad day, but we'll be back next week. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot more to what I'm trying to do. And uh, I hope I can find that voice and, and articulate that along this journey. Does the sponsor have some, I mean, you mentioned the sponsor and do they have some additional role other than just sort of being along for the ride and, and seeing an opportunity, like you're kind of experiencing it now a little bit more from my perspective where it's like, it's such a story that the ROI exists in the story. You don't have to go win for them to benefit. Is there yeah. some bigger role that they're playing or is this, um, or is this just what's helping it be possible at all? Yeah. I think the founder, Ernie Garcia Jr. Picked up on that quickly with our, our conversations that we had. Um, he mentioned it was similar to Jordan trying to leave basketball and go play baseball and, how marketers probably wish that they could have been a part of that journey somehow and, and couldn't and weren't, but here, here you can. So um, Carvana has not been in motorsports marketing in the past. So, you know, as a growing car business and trying to get to car people um, my demographic fits their core demographic very well. There's a lot of synergy there, but, but most importantly um, you know, the executive staff, loves the story and they, they can see and understand the power in that story. Mm. So uh, they, they really understand it for all the right reasons. Well, yeah, I'm sure you'll be, get an opportunity to talk to them a little bit more directly, which is, you know, I mean, people need inspiration right now. People need stories, people, I mean, right. I mean, look at how we watch oh. the, the Jordan documentary. Look at how we watch the tiger documentary. <laughs> like, yeah. We're yeah. all looking for a story five years ago, but yeah, that was just uh, when the pandemic started, we all got it. It wasn't even a year ago. Yeah. Can anyone believe that tiger King was like nine months ago, right. Or yeah. something so much longer. So much life has happened. Um, so um, have you heard from Chad? Yeah, we stay in touch. He's actually helping uh, Action Express, uh, the car, the team that I'm driving for in the Rolex 24. We need a few experienced kind of crew guys to come down and pit the what? car. What? So he's on your car? He's going to be there, um, kind of watching and taking it all in and then also helping bring in, I think, four other bodies to, to crew the car for the weekend. So he's crewing your car. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, or he's crew chiefing your car or engineering your car. What, what would you call it in yeah, sports cars? Is it a, engineering? Maybe more of a second or third engineer. Uh, well, for those people who don't know, I mean, you know, uh, Chad Canales is Jimmy's 
crew chief for ever. How many years is he a crew chief? 17? 17 seasons, yeah. And then he just left you high and dry for those last couple of years. <laughs> no, we, we weren't getting along so well in those. Really? Tell years. me about it. This sounds like a breakup. <laughs> it was a breakup. It, it really what happened? Was. You know, reflecting back on it, I, I think we both wish we handled some things differently. Um, <laughs> Doesn't but, every breakup. <laughs> right? You know, we, we, we operated at a level um, – that, you know, I I guess you could argue that no one has in the sport and NASCAR before and and executed at a certain level. And that, that came at a price, you know, it it really took, you know, a lot of people say they're all in, but it took everything out of both of us. And Mm -hmm. as, uh, as time went on and we both kind of grew in our, our ways, um, you know, I think we tried too hard to stick to the model that used to work instead of growing together and finding a new way to do things. And that Mm -hmm. put a lot of tension between us. Mm. And eventually, you know, Mr. Hendrick had asked himself, you know, do I want these two yelling at each other on the radio week in and week out television and radio playing those clips, the performance isn't there, you know, and then we're, we're with stuck with that tough decision and, and split, I guess, at the end of the 18 season. You got to take my role for the clips of swearing. Then you got to take it over from me on that. What is that called after the NASCAR weekends? And active. Like, Radioactive. Yes. I always heard from uh, uh, Ricky when we used to date, like that he hated me swearing, and I was on radioactive all the time, apparently swearing. I didn't really listen to him, but I heard I made the I made the cut most of the time. Yeah, so I'm so glad that they found you and Chad that you could um, fill in that gap. Yes, yes, I'm glad to take over for you. It means we have a, a very interesting vocabulary, I believe. Um, do you feel like there was something that you, cause you said, you know, I wish I would have handled things differently. You know, I think that whether it's our personal relationships or, I mean, it's hard to not call you and Chad a personal relationship, but a professional relationship. I mean, we learn a lot from these interactions with our partners and family and, and all these people. I mean, what was that thing that you came away from with that? sort of, as you know, you call like a breakup on some level. Um, uh, Was there something you learned from it that was really, really valuable? Yeah, I think my takeaway was I need to speak up earlier and more often. Mm -hmm. And with his personality and really what the job entails for a crew chief, you know, they have to boss everybody around all the time. And crew chiefs get really comfortable with that. And the lines that they're, that they cross in that process of leading hundreds of people day in and day out dealing with the good and the bad. Like there's a point where I, I, I would be told something or hear something that I didn't like. And I'd, I'd carry that around with me. And then I'd maybe say something back knowing I could push a button on his side. And then, you know, there's just this thing that would kind of happen. Mm-hmm. So I, I wish that I would, would have said more, said more and said it more, uh, said it, say it earlier instead of letting it build to a point where I'd explode and then, you know, and then put him on his heels Mm. It just the timing of that was all bad. So uh, addressing things earlier and being more communicative, communicative would be uh, would be the takeaway. Do you see that showing up like at home too? Totally. It's we want to believe that we um, compartmentalize things, but we really are creatures of habit and handle those situations all the same. It's so true. Yep. Or I think. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's you can't get away from patterns. Yeah. It's just, it's how we're wired. You know, it's just who we are. And it doesn't mean you can't work on those things and learn and grow and, and change, but you have to spot them and recognize them first before you can make those changes. Have you ever done therapy? Yes. I've done plenty. Mm. That was part and- of my discovery and, in, in uh, understanding, honestly, that there's, I always thought there was this professional life. No, I, I just behave that way over here at work. No, it's on both sides of the fence. Mm. I just think that that's such a topic that like, I mean, shoot, I've got two therapists right now. Like, I mean, I've gone through waves of it. I spent a lot of, I spent a good chunk of my, I spent an early part of my life with therapy. Then I was like, fuck therapy. And then I'm like, <laughs> and, but really what I ended up finding was that you need to do therapy for yourself, not for so much the dynamic. When you fix yourself, you fix the dynamic, which is why you say you can't go fix it for the Chad situation because it shows up with Shani, right? Like you can't go fixing it for like between the two of you. It's actually just you and you. Yep. 
Did totally. you find, I mean, I found that when I, you know, being single and like doing therapy, I was like, wow, this is so much more productive to do it for myself. Yeah, no, it really is. I, I completely agree with you. It's a self thing. Um, I, I feel like two were, you mentioned, you know, it's kind of come and go for you in your life. And it has for me too. And I think, you know, you got to go out and live a little and, and have some stuff happen. And then for myself, I've been able to learn more on the back end instead of just constantly being checked in and going, you know, going through the motions. It's nice to go out and live a little and then check back in and, and kind of yeah. evaluate what goes on. I've, I've had more success with that pattern than, than the more consistent way. Yeah. Well, it allows you to kind of uh, enjoy the level you've reached of like cohesiveness or calmness or peace instead of just always feeling like there's a carrot out there. Um, but I think that therapy is super productive and I just feel like it's not something that people talk about a lot. You know, yeah. it's not like people are waving their flag going, you know, I have a therapist. I just got out of therapy. I was crying for an hour. Ooh, do you cry? Are you one of those guys that cries? No, can you cry? no. I can. Yes. It's pretty rare, but I, I can. Um, I'd love to give Jeff Gordon a hard time whenever something, something big happens, his eyes well up and he cries. So, uh, I'm very thankful that I can harass him and I have not had that happen throughout my, my career, especially up, up in those public moments. You remember that his first win he cried like a baby when he got out of the race car. Oh my God. I was like two. I don't know. No, well, I'm so first banquet, like there's some different moments. If you go, go on the, uh, the I'm gonna, now I'm going to go on a Google search of Jeff Gordon crying. You'll see plenty. <laughs> Wait, but you said you like, I'm glad that wasn't me. So you don't want to cry. Yeah. I guess maybe it's just being a guy where I was like, boy, yeah. race car driver does not look tough. You know, glad that wasn't me type thing. So you basically just said Jeff does not look tough. He did not in those moments. No. <laughs> <laughs> and he would admit that too. <laughs> um, like along that same vein, are there some things that you've realized like from your own sort of childhood? And if you're in therapy, there's no doubt you're going into childhood. There's no doubt that you're going into parenting, um, how your parents parented you. I mean, are there some things that you feel like have stuck out where you're like, man, these are some things that I... I'm going to do differently with my kids. Yeah. And there's definitely things that you reflect on. And, you know, the, the one that comes to mind the, the quickest is the dynamic that's put on parents and children when their kids are in sports. And it probably applies to other things, but my parents did everything that they could for their kids to pursue motorsports and, you know, things worked out the best for me and, and, what people naturally think with the success that I've had. And, you know, that, that didn't come at the expense of, of some peace with my parents, you know, they, they did everything they could to give me these chances and these opportunities. But at some point in time, they had a hard time of letting go and letting me be me and letting me get off on my own. Um, you know, of course I had my parents employed working for me and there was the uncomfortable moment in time of like, Hey, mom and dad, I'm gonna do something different, right? So th that whole piece, um, you know, I hope that I'm in a similar situation where I give my kids everything that they need and their their career is taking off and they have to say, hey dad, you know, I got it. And, and I and in that moment, you know, I think there's learning on my side in advance going into it. And then I need to pick up on some cues um, from my own experience if they don't, if they're not able to tell me to, you know, hey, dad, step back type thing. So that dynamic comes to mind the quickest. Yeah, so true. I think in racing too, it's also a little bit more difficult because there's no natural transition. You don't go to college. You don't like, you know what I mean? There's no, um, there's no severance of a pattern. They stay engaged. And so I did the same thing. I hired my parents and honestly, I wouldn't even change it because it's the best decision I could make. I didn't know who to trust back then, Right. but then I had Pretty to fire true. them. That's never fun. And that's not fun no. at all. So, yeah. And, you know, again, kind of like maybe therapy, there's these ebbs and flows of like, you know, there's so much freedom and, you know, remember the days and you get to ride your bicycle wherever you want. And now it's like, 
uh, only if I'm riding next to you and we're going to the end of the cul-de-sac and back and, and you don't get training wheels off until you're at least a teenager. And, you know, there's the more the helicopter kind of parent sort of mindset and just the fear of the world being so scary out there. And, wow. you know, maybe now we're kind of entering a phase kind of like, you know, in a lot of other ways where we're getting more holistic even or more natural with our remedies for things and food and farm to table, like, things are kind of going more grassroots again and a little bit more freedom and a little bit more, um, yeah, just kind of going like regressing, but in an aware way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're, we're on that pattern, especially with Shani's upbringing and kind of what she's plugged into and naturally drawn to. Um, and in my experience, the woman really leads the household. So uh, Shani's uh, maternal ways and just her awesome vision and, and presence in, in trying to help us all be healthy mind, body, and soul, you know, her, her layers of all that are, are helping us. And we're trying hard not to be the helicopter parents. And I find that, you know, our summers in Colorado or the time we spend in Colorado really lets us kind of step back and let, and give them more freedom and let them be, you know, be themselves much more and have that freedom that, that we really did as a kid growing up. Yeah. That makes me think of something I wanted to ask you about just because of how long you were in NASCAR and watching sort of the arc of this, like, I'm going to call it like helicopter fans, right? Like, you know, it went from being this, you know, it went from the old days of freedom and you could do what you wanted. There was no social media, you know, no drug testing. There was no cameras everywhere. There's, you know, there's just, I mean, there's shoot, no pit road speed limit at some point in time. Like, I mean, there was so much more there was so much more freedom and decision that could be made. And I'm super curious about like, what, what was your first year in NASCAR? First, first year in cup or first time ever in a NASCAR vehicle? Like in cup even, or just, or Bush or would it be called Bush then? Well, so my first Bush race was in 98 and my mm -hmm. first cup race was in 2001. Yeah. So even like from 98, you're still kind of living that life, yeah. right? What was it like in those late nineties versus like, what could you guys, what was a normal weekend? Like that for me was really kind of the era of all the teams staying in a host hotel, you know, in a way, or a couple hotels around the track. And you knew the local spots to eat, the local watering holes. And it was pretty simple. The garage closed and you went and grabbed a shower and then you'd go run into various crew guys that were just out, you know, and you'd be out and, you know, try to behave well, rotate some waters through, try to have, <laughs> have somebody there to send you home when it was time and uh, sleep it off and show up and go again. I mean, it was much more simple back then. And, and even um, at that point in time for me, you know, a lot of it was driving to races. It wasn't even flying, let alone flying on your own plane. So um, it was a far different environment. Hmm. Do you think it was more fun? It was for me because of the age, it, it was my life and it was a lifestyle. So I had an absolute blast. Yeah. There's no way I could have been married or started a family or been a good father in that period of time. Just because, I mean, not only were you gone on the weekends, but a lot of this drive time to and from races, the amount of testing that was able to take place back then, um, you were never home and you're gone. So I, I wouldn't be the husband or the father that I'd want to be just because I'd never be home. Yeah. 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 What else was different back then? I mean, I just feel like it was a whole different world. Oh, no soft walls, no Hans device, flimsy aluminum seats. You know, when you, when you hit something, uh, there were a lot of us playing hurt. When you hit something, you were hurt from a concussion, broken sternums, broken collarbones, shoulders, wrists. I mean, you, you played hurt quite a bit back then. Mm, that's why you had to drink. <laughs> yes. Because you were in such pain. <laughs> you were all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are some, I mean, what are some fun things that you do like now, like, I don't know. It's, it's hard even to say that because you're so like not retired, but were there, are there things that you want to do or things that you can imagine? Wait a minute. How did I miss this? You went to Burning Man. I did. Yes. Oh my God. I want to know. Cause I want to go. It is, it is worth going to. You can tell me what other people did. 
tell me what other people did. So when I, the following Burning Man, I, we had a race in Darlington and I, I told the NASCAR folks, I'm like, do you guys just want to cut the chase now and send me the drug screening trailer straight away? Like, <laughs> is that the move? Um, but it, it was um, way bigger than I imagined. Um, I think the year we went, they, you know, they sell out all the time, but they allowed 75,000 people to, to be on the playa. We arrived on uh, opening day and stayed till midweek. So we really caught the kind of calm side where the camps are being built and assembled because there's really a week that you come in and set up and then you're out and you can leave no trace. So we, we were there, I feel like more with the true burners and the, the people that are, are there for the, the experience more than the Instagram picture. Uh, so we, we missed that back half when the place was at capacity and the burn and all the other stuff that went on. But what a, what an interesting day. I mean, we were there, I think three days and we'd wake up in the morning and fill our camelbacks full of water, get on our bikes and, right. uh, and off you go. Bring plenty of stuff to barter, a little bit of dancing, um, and just explore. I mean, we found a roller skating rink out in the middle of the playa. I mean, just you name it. Is there anything you can think that could be built is there. And it's all just a chill hang experience with one another. It was fantastic. Would you go again? Without a doubt. Would right. love to go again. Yeah. We should go. Definitely should go. I'm not sure with COVID. I don't think it happened last year. And I there's some rumors that it's had a tough time surviving, which I don't understand why. Um, you know, without having the financial piece moving along. Uh, so hopefully it's still around and, and uh, whenever COVID goes away, I will be one of the first in line to get a ticket. Um, <clears throat> did you learn, because I feel like one of the things about Burning Man is just how, um, you know, it's kind of a spiritual experience. It can be whatever you want it to. I mean, I literally on our bike ride exploring went by a family area where there were these amazing play sets for families to, to camp and play. And they were having their experience. You get closer uh, to the, to the man and up on this one side of, of the playa, definitely the party side. Um, our camp fortunately was over on the quiet side and, you know, we would, we were all ready to party, but we would kind of mount up on our bicycles and ride to it to go, you know, experience and then kind of come back and retreat and, and get sleep. But the, uh, the thing that was so cool is just the energy and mm -hmm. to be around so many people, of the same mindset and so mm -hmm. free, uh, there, there's a, an experience there that, um, you know, if I hear, hear some of the house music that plays from, from Burning Man, I can kind of bring that feeling back and, and remember it, but it is so ever present when you're there, just the energy of all these people. When you, you just said other people of the same mindset, and I would say that like, that would be my jam. I would love to go there. That's why I love to go to places like Tulum and I like to go to Sedona or whatever. It's this sort of high vibe, energy, openness, positivity. Like you're not talking about politics. You're not talking about those kinds of things. You're really, so I feel like you saying that makes me feel like I know you better. Good. It, you would, you would totally dig the place too, but yeah, that, that, uh, that, ex that energy experience and that, that same mindset was the, the huge takeaway for me. It was awesome. So maybe we all just need to basically become burners. If the world became burners, don't you think that would solve everything? It, it would. And when you see, it, it would be a good start. When you see <laughs> that city that pops up over a week and how everybody interacts and gets along, you really, nobody mentions last names, you know, that status kind of disappears and um, it's all inclusive and you can use a barter system and trade, trade along the way to food, drink, whatever it might be that uh, you just see how this community works. It's really inspiring and, uh, and teaches you to open your heart. I've often thought that I keep, I've been saying it for years about starting a commune and like all the sh shit's hitting the fan everywhere. And I'm like, we just need to start a commune. If yeah. you were, if you were in the commune, if we were in a commune together, I, I like to ask people, what would your talent be? What would you, what would you bring to the commune? Cause you have to bring something like I would be a trainer. I'd like to be the gardener and a chef and I could use some help. Like, you know, me and someone else could handle it, for sure the kitchen, but like, what would you bring to the commune? Yeah, I would try to join you in the training piece and maybe yes. do some mountain biking or cycling, or, you know, some kind of cardio activity.
Oh, good. You can lead. You can be like the Lance Armstrong of our group. You can be the cardio king. You can be the endurance guy. Yeah. I'll be the hit trainer. There you go. (laughs) What would Shani bring? Uh, She would, she would probably want to be your yoga, uh, being the yoga squad, I would say, and in cooking and also gardening her mom, her and her mom. And then now Genevieve as a result, her oldest, um, they just have a certain thing about them with their green thumb. And they're always cooking. Um, We have a garden here in the backyard and Evie will be out there kind of working in the garden, tending things so that that she would help you there. Jimmy, I had no idea how cohesive I was with your family, but it sounds (laughs) like we could live in the commune. Evie and I would get along little rebels that like to ask a lot of questions. Um, And um, we'd just be like the health and fitness gurus. That's it. Be healthy and good. Okay. I'll let you know when it opens. Perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Until then, good luck in IndyCar. Thank you. I'm so excited for it. I'm going to be cheering for you a lot. I really, like, I really hope you have a fun experience. And part of that will be, you know, having a decent result. And I'm going to hope that that happens. Like, I want you to want you to come away having a lot of fun. Cause like I had a lot of fun in NASCAR and I had some decent results here and there. And, um, you know, you, in fact, I don't doubt you will, you're going to have a great experience. Uh, I appreciate it. It's all about the experience. I'm going to have fun. Yeah. Yeah. Be careful for the grip strength though. Yeah. The little things, your phone, a magazine, like carrying your luggage in any way, like those are the little things that I remember worrying about in IndyCar that I didn't think about it all in NASCAR. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, my, my, what's crazy is just to see how much my body's changing, obviously in the process. I've mm-hmm. never had forms before and they're, they're starting to show up now. <laughs> power really? steering was nice for all those years. <laughs> oh, I know. That's what I said. I'm like, guys, the IndyCars didn't have power steering, you know? Yeah. You're like, I'm starting at, Three to minus three degrees caster, and I'm up to minus two degrees caster. Slowly chipping away at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, good luck. Cool. Thank you, Danica. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.